I am at Barclay Press uh, halftime right now. Um, there are actually, there are three of us in the office. We're all part-time and we have managed to publish almost 20 books so far this year and think that we might get as many as, as 45 in by the end of the year during the pandemic. Um, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Paper prices went up, people were sick and out of the office, uh, writers um, and, and all kinds of other people were trying to figure out how to work from home. Uh, I don't know if any of you had this experience, but in March 2020, I started out with a laptop on the couch and usually by the end of each day, I was on the floor because my back hurt. And uh, around May or June, I got a standing desk and then I got tired of standing, so I needed a mat. And now I have a standing desk and a sitting desk and a mat and a stool and a room in my home that works as an office. Um, I don't know what you dealt with over those years, but uh, Barclay Press built up a big backlog of books during that time, of writers who were waiting on us, waiting very patiently, in some cases waiting for years. And this year, um, partly because of the generosity that you've shown Barclay Press in the monthly gift that Readwood Friends has been sending our way, uh, but also in a special gift that came from Hillsborough Friends and an increase in giving from Sierra Cascades, Barclay Press now has the resources to get caught up on all of that work that we got behind on. Um, our next Quaker title is called Brightening My Corner. It's from uh, Ruth Lore Malloy. She is a Chinese-Canadian Quaker who has traveled the world doing all kinds of work with various nonprofits from indigenous people in Alaska to, um, to very poor people in Mexico, um, to China and Malaysia and et cetera, et cetera. And this memoir of hers is, is coming out shortly after. She just turned 90 this year. So um, we're very excited to have that coming out. And, plenty of books after that. I'm also working half-time at Hillsborough Friends. Hillsborough Friends Church doesn't have a traditional Sunday gathering. Instead, today, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., they have what they're calling service for service. And service for service at Hillsborough Friends is a community meal. Anybody from the community is welcome to come. Uh, there's a continental breakfast at 10. Uh, we usually have some kind of a hot lunch served at 11 or 11.30. And then at 1 p.m., before folks leave, they are sent home with uh, whatever leftovers we have that they want to take, but also a uh, sack lunch or multiple sack lunches. We also have a clothing closet. Um, we have done some tentative connecting with three other nonprofits in town in order to help with providing housing and connections to other resources. And right now, um, they are probably serving food today to, to between 18 and 25 uh, houseless people, mainly men, um, although there are some women that come as well. And I'm at Hillsborough Friends Halftime helping to oversee that program. Actually, most of what I do has been getting taxes in order, uh, uh, fixing the facility. We put in new flooring. Um, there were about uh, 12 years of unresolved tax issues that I spent months on. Uh, lots of office paperwork, figuring out how to do payroll. Uh, it's been a steep learning curve and also a really good challenging, challenging in a good way place for me to be. I thought about calling uh, my talk this morning, the crowing. If any of you are fans of Schitt's Creek, uh, Moira Rose is the, the star in a full length feature that is filmed in a small European country. And there are a couple scenes where they have crow attacks and other interesting crow interactions. But I wasn't sure, um, how well that would actually come across. Would people know what I'm referring to? But I do want to talk about crows. And the reason I want to talk about crows is because the time in which we live, which is not necessarily unique, every time has had um, issues of danger, issues of power imbalances, issues of misogyny and racism and patriarchy and Christian supremacy and white supremacy. Like these are not new issues. But the kinds of things we're dealing with today may feel to many of you, I know they do to me, like things that might be life or death issues for my neighbors, 
for my family, for my community, for the people that I care about, for the people that I read about in the news. Just as an example, since January 1, there have already been more than 190 mass shootings. In the last two weeks, there were three just in the state of Texas, one of them being the second largest, um, not only in our nation's history, but also the second largest in the last two years, which says something about the time that we're in. I get overwhelmed because I feel like I should be doing something, but I don't know what I could possibly do. How could I fix anything, let alone the problems that I see on the news, read about on Twitter, or experience in my own community? What could I possibly do in a dangerous time that would make a difference, that would matter? And then I think about crows and I'm encouraged. I realize, oh, I'm already doing something that matters. And I'm gonna tell you more about that later, but I'm not gonna get to it right away because there's some foundation work. There's some buildup, there's some context that needs to be given to the story that I wanna share about crows. As Quakers, there's an expression that many of you are probably familiar with. It's not necessarily a Quaker expression, but it's an expression that Quakers frequently use, speak truth to power. This is an expression that reminds us of our responsibility to tell the truth to those with the power to stop oppressing others. I have a stack of papers here on the left and they're not ordered. Um, and so I'll flip through them from time to time. But each of them uh, is some text that I wanna share with you. An example of someone who spoke truth to power and who did it consistently, an example who just happens to be a Quaker is a woman that we know of. Her name is Mary Fisher. She was born in Yorkshire, possibly at Pontefract. And as a young woman, she worked as a housemaid for Richard and Elizabeth Tomlinson at Selby. But in late December, 1651, her employers had a guest. That guest's name was George Fox and he gave a message. And then there was open worship silence that followed that message. And that fellowship that Mary Fisher experienced as a housemaid in that home resonated so profoundly with her that as a result, she became an active Quaker. And by active Quaker, I don't mean someone who attended meeting every week. She became an activist Quaker. In 1652, as a Quaker publisher of truth, Mary Fisher publicly rebuked the vicar of Selby Church in an address to his congregation after worship. She was imprisoned at York Castle. In 1653, accompanied by Elizabeth Williams, Fisher walked to Cambridge as part of a Quaker drive to proselytize the South of England. And there, the two of these, these two women rebuked the student seminarians at Sydney Sussex College. By order of the mayor, they were, as a result, taken to the Market Cross under the pretext that they were vagabonds. They were stripped to the waist, and they became the first Quakers to be publicly flogged for their ministry. In 1655, Fisher was again imprisoned for rebuking the priest of Newport Pagnell in Buckinghamshire. She actually spoke truth to power a lot and she got trouble in trouble for it consistently. In 1656, Mary Fisher and Anne Austin became the first Quakers to visit the English North American colonies arriving at Boston. On arrival, they were taken ashore, imprisoned, forced to undress in public and their bodies were intimately examined for signs of witchcraft. Their books and pamphlets were seized and burned by the Boston hangman. In 1658, Fisher traveled in a group of six Quakers to the Mediterranean to visit the Ottoman Empire to expound her Quaker faith to the Sultan Mehmed IV. I could go on, but this is an example of someone who spoke truth to power. There's a problem, though, with speaking truth to power, a problem for us as Quakers, and that is many of us, at least here in the United States, have been taught that in order to speak truth to power, you have to be on the same stage as power. You have to be the right kind of person to hold their attention, to be taken seriously, to get their respect. Now, Mary Fisher got thrown in prison a lot 
and flogged and undressed because she didn't do respectability politics. She just said what needed to be said. And we don't know if her saying those things made the change that she hoped for. She just spoke truth to power. But in our own society, there is this sense that we have to dress right. We need to make an appointment. We need to be the right kind of person in the right kind of place with the right kind of support. And what this does for us as we attempt as Quakers to speak truth to power is often we find ourselves focused more on how to get access to power, focused more on the powerful themselves. Our energies go into getting into that room, finding a seat at that table, um, being strategic as opposed to making change, doing something. This is not necessarily a bad thing. And I wanna say that speaking truth to power is something that needs to happen, needs to continue to happen, but that might not be my responsibility. My responsibility might be something different. There's two games that um, youth groups often play. One of these is a game that is not condoned by leadership. And the other one is a game that is often organized by leadership. And these two games illustrate that problem that occurs with speaking truth to power. The first game is King of the Hill. I don't know if any of you have played it. Uh, it's a game that works fairly well in the back parking lot here because of the steep section of asphalt. Um, although the top of the hill is too big of an area for one person to adequately defend. And so you'd probably have to do it in teams here at Reedwood. But King of the Hill, when I was a kid, was best played on a gravel pile because it's slippery and there's lots of things to pick up. Oh, sorry. I was not necessarily a good kid. Um, <laughs> there are lots of ways to play and fight dirty in King of the Hill on a gravel pile. Um, but in King of the Hill, you spend an awful lot of time scrambling your way to the top, fighting for position, trying to remove whoever's already there. And then once you get to the top of the hill, you spend all of your energies defending your position. Speaking truth to power is good, but speaking truth to power can become not good when our energies are focused on maintaining our ability to be in power as opposed to questioning or challenging it. The other game is called sardines. I don't know if any of you have played sardines. Sardines is basically reverse hide and seek. And I will tell you, I've played sardines in this building here at Reedwood, and it is so much fun. Um, you turn off all of the lights late at night and um, cloak the windows as best you can because the lights from the parking lot might still come into the building. Somebody is sent off somewhere into the building. They don't tell you where. And they're given, depending on the generosity of the group, 60 seconds or two minutes or five minutes to hide while everybody else is crowded into a classroom excitedly jabbering and thinking about what's going to happen when they when the game begins when the time is reached everyone that's not hiding is released and they wander around the darkened building running into these tripping over those um i actually uh for whatever reason when i was in ninth or 10th grade, we were playing sardines in this building and I decided that I was gonna search under every single pew. And I wasn't the only person doing that. And I actually, cause I was moving quickly because it's a big building that you have to cover in order to find the person as quickly as possible. I head butted somebody pretty hard and had to take a little bit of time out of that game. In King of the Hill, you're fighting for position. And then once you gain it, you're defending that position. In sardines, you're looking for the one person way out on the margins of the group, hidden and invisible. And when you find that person, you join them. You hide with them and wait for other people to find you. It's a form of solidarity where you leave the crowd in order to find the one that's been lost or left behind or left out. You join them. And over time, others join you in that dark corner until that dark corner becomes the center of the community. King of the Hill is what can happen when 
our focus is on speaking, speaking truth to power. Sardines is what can happen when we decide to take another route. And I am not saying that speaking truth to power is ineffective, inefficient, unjust, or wrong. I'm just saying that for me, it doesn't work. And so it's been helpful for me to think about other metaphors, other ways of dealing with injustice, of thinking about oppression, of considering what my place might be, what my work might be, what I'm called to do, what I'm supposed to do, what I'm gifted to do. But if I'm gonna play sardines in the world, I mean, what, what does that mean? Like, it's a helpful metaphor. And I think that some people are like, oh, that makes sense. But who am I supposed to find? Who am I supposed to be looking for? If they're invisible, how will I know when I've found them? And how do I love someone on the margins? And is it loving to just stay out there with them? What if nobody else comes? Luke gives us an example of what it might mean for us to play sardines rather than king of the hill. Luke chapter 10, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. So I think that this is maybe how we play sardines. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. And we love our neighbor as ourself. There's two parts here. One, how do I love God? And I know that it's not necessarily correct to tie a bunch of scriptures together because you are potentially taking them out of context. But I also think that by putting scripture into discussion with other scripture, we sometimes make connections that we might not otherwise make. And so I'm going to jump over to Matthew chapter 25 in my attempt to answer this question, how do I love God? Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, I'm adding my own word here, perplexed. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. How do we love God? By taking care of each other. Someone's hungry, we give them food. Somebody's naked, we give them clothes. Somebody's sick or in prison, we visit them. This is how we love God. It's not necessarily the only way to love God. I could have chosen a lot of other scriptures, but this is a way to love God. And this has been helpful to me. If I'm going to play sardines rather than king of the hill, I can do that by paying attention to the needs of people around me and doing what I can to address, to answer, to respond to those needs. This is something I can do. Who is my neighbor? If I'm going to love God and love neighbor... How do I love God? Take care of people. But who is my neighbor? Wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus. Isn't it convenient that this question's already in the text? And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, 
leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do like, likewise. There's a, definitely a parallel between these two scriptures. How do I love God? By taking care of the needs of people around me. How do I love my neighbor? By showing mercy. And in the story, specifically by showing mercy to those in need. In August of 2021, during the pandemic, just like a lot of other people did, I moved out of my Lloyd District apartment and moved into a house over by Glendevere Golf Course. It's, it's an older home and there were some problems. We needed to replace the roof. Uh, there were some electrical issues. Um, it's got a big yard and it is so much work to keep up any size yard, let alone a big yard. Now actually big is relative. My yard's about 9,000 square feet. And I'm sure that for some people that doesn't seem like a big yard at all. Uh, but for me, it was overwhelmingly huge. In fact, I did gardening for about two hours before I came over here this morning because there's just always stuff to do. Weeding, watering, squirrels. I don't know if any of you had trouble with squirrels, but um, they're hungry and they eat all the time. And there are a lot of squirrels in my neighborhood, which I thought was so cute and so natural and so fun until every single strawberry disappeared and half of one of the new baby rhododendrons. I didn't know that they eat rhododendron leaves. Apparently they have to be really hungry. So I did some research and it turns out that the best way to deal with squirrels is to feed them, which seemed counterintuitive to me. Like, won't that just attract more squirrels? And it turns out that it does. But the theory here is that if you have a regular feeding station and feeding time for the squirrels and enough food to keep them from being hungry, they'll leave your plants alone. It's a good theory. And it mostly works unless we're away for vacation or unless the neighbor squirrels start coming over or unless other animals start taking the food that we'd intended for the squirrels to have. It's usually the other way around where the squirrels are constantly getting into the food that we leave out for the birds, but it can happen this way too. We also found that the squirrels, um, as soon as they identified us as food purveyors, they started following us everywhere. You step out the back door and there's a squirrel there. You stand up from weeding and there is a squirrel right next to you, like touching distance away. And squirrels have very poor eyesight, so they can't necessarily tell if you have a peanut in your hand or if it's just your hand. And they will go in for that peanut that they think is there. And sometimes if you're not fast enough, you will get bitten or scratched. Squirrels are cute, but they're not my favorite animal I've learned. So um, we did a training regimen where if a squirrel came outside, we refused to eat it until it went and stood on the feeding post. There is a portion of our back porch and we only serve peanuts if they're sitting on that little four inch square. We didn't have to mark it. It only took them about a week to figure it out. They're smart when it comes to food and when they're desperate enough. And so now we go outside and the squirrel comes up waits for us to notice it, runs over to the feeding post, and we'll wait for up to 20 minutes for us to bring in a peanut. We've timed it. It does run out of patience after 20 minutes. Um, unless it's raining. Sometimes when it's raining, it'll wait longer than 20 minutes up on that post because there's an overhang there so it can stay dry. We started putting all of the squirrel food right there on that post. But every once in a while, just as I was going inside, because there's a door to the kitchen there, or coming out, I would notice just a flicker of black feather. 
the food that was intended for the squirrel was also sometimes being eaten by a crow. We also have a very small pond and we started seeing the crow down there, especially on hot days. And then there were two crows and then there were 16. There are about 16 crows that live in our neighborhood. And um, at some point they started to think of us as their neighbors. So we did some research like, are these crows together? It turns out that they are. Once crows reach sexual maturity around three to four years, they're tough to take out and can live to be 14 to 17 years old, though they can live twice that long in captivity. Like many other species of birds, crows and ravens engage in what's called communal roosting. This is where groups of both kin and unrelated individuals flock to a particular location for in part the security of safety in numbers while they sleep. They can gather in the tens, even the hundreds of thousands when they do this. Their favorite food is dried pet food, but a cheaper option is whole unshelled peanuts. We'd been putting out whole unshelled peanuts and the crows had found them. So we started putting out peanuts just for the crows. Uh, and they started to visit us on a regular basis. Um, we also started to note that one of the crows was only there for part of the year and she would disappear for a good three months. In fact, right now we haven't seen her since um, I think the end of March. We have not seen her regularly since the end of March. And we're pretty sure that she is part of a nesting pair and that the largest crow that was strutting around our yard this morning around 5.30 might potentially be her mate. And that these other crows that are in our neighborhood are probably older children. One of the things that we learned in our research about crows is that they tend to live in extended family units. And that extended family unit um, allows the babies to be supported by a whole community, as opposed to being solely dependent on a mommy crow and a daddy crow. In research that was done uh, over the course of, I think, decades, um, I know that it was more than six years, uh, in Florida, they noted that these younger crows often don't get their own mate until they're at least five or six years old, sometimes a little bit older. Instead, they continue to serve as family helpers to their mom and dad. These helpers would bring sticks and other nesting material to help the female build the nest. At one nest, there were five helper crows busily bringing sticks faster than the one female could handle them. The project quickly became a disorganized mess. Eventually, the female somehow communicated that it was time to halt stick deliveries. It took her an additional two weeks to finally complete the nest with the materials on hand. In this study, Killam concluded, there's a limit conceivably to the number of adult auxiliaries that can be of help rather than a hindrance. In other words, too many cooks in the kitchen. Killam noted that the visit rate of helpers at hatching time was also very high but they weren't necessarily bringing food. He noted instead, it seems that many of the visits were made of curiosity. And each time the female moved aside, a help, so when a helper came, giving it a chance to look at the young. These crows that are part of the extended family, up to 20 times an hour, they may bring food for the nesting crow and also for the fledglings once that they're hatched, up to 20 times an hour. They're bringing food, um, working together as a team to make sure that those babies and that mom get supported. But they come even more frequently than that just to see the babies. Just to see, how are they doing? How big are they now? They're growing like weeds. We noticed our first year in this house that around June or July, there were some crows that were smaller than the others, a group of about four or five that seemed to travel together. And every once in a while, two of them would come to a line in front of our house and yell at us, caw, 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 um, until we came out with peanuts. And we think, we think that they'd been sent on food errands, that they were being trained with the easy, nice humans before they learned to find food on their own. Um, for instance, 
there's a McDonald's about a mile and a half from us. And every once in a while, we will find uh, a McDonald's branded bag in our neighborhood. And usually it's in the middle of the road. And usually there are two crows there with it. So they're, they're scavengers. And they know that humans are good sources of food. And we wanted to develop some kind of a connection with them. So we started being providers of food, uh, speaking to them in two different languages and making sure that we had a variety of things for them to sample cat food, both dry and wet. Um, although if there's a picture of a cat on the can, some of the crows will eye it very carefully to make sure that it's just a two-dimensional representation and not the real thing. We, um, we had some trouble in our neighborhood. Uh, three different times, somebody came onto our property and tried to break into our vehicles. And one of those times I was awake and I saw them on the camera and I went out to confront them wearing Crocs, shorts and a t-shirt. I didn't have my house keys or my phone to call for help because I wasn't thinking. It was too early for that. And as I confronted uh, the young man who was in my driveway, he turned and started running. And then all of a sudden, there were crows chasing him out of the neighborhood. And I thought to myself, they're helping me. Now, I don't know if that was actually their intent. It's hard to tell because they don't speak English fluently. Although we do have a crow, a crow that occasionally meows at the neighborhood cat. Um, but I felt like we might be on the same team. One of the things that we also noticed early on is that after we'd started feeding the crows, they started warning us. Anytime there's five cats in the neighborhood and anytime one of them approached our yard, a crow would fly over the roof and down over the garden and caw at us, intruder, intruder. We also get notifications when there's a UPS delivery or a FedEx or an Amazon delivery truck on the front side of our house. And we sometimes get notifications when our neighbors come home with an odd shaped object. Yesterday, our neighbors had a very large cactus and usually the crows don't tell us anything about our neighbors, but they needed us to know that something is happening over there. It's been interesting getting to know these crows. And, and we've noticed that their knowledge of us seems to be spreading. There's a Home Depot near us, and when we park there, crows approach our car like they recognize it, like they know who we are and that we might have peanuts in our pockets. When we come home from work, either one of us, my partner or I, crows swoop into our front yard and greet us. We, we originally thought that they wanted food, but we toss food out and they're not interested in it. It's like they're just saying hi. We know from research that crows have the ability to recognize human faces and to differentiate, not just between human faces, but they also have shown in studies that crows can tell the difference between different human languages. A five-year study of crows living near Seattle and Washington state show the birds can remember a quote unquote dangerous human and are able to share their knowledge of the learned danger with their offspring and with other crows. Because human actions often threaten animals, learning socially about individual people's habits is probably advantageous. In the study, observers either wore a so-called neutral mask or one of the quote unquote dangerous masks that had been worn during an initial trapping event. In that initial trapping event, people wearing only the dangerous mask trapped, banded and released seven to 15 birds at five different sites near Seattle. Within the first two weeks after the trapping, an average of 26% of crows encountered scolded the person wearing the dangerous mask. After 1.25 years, 31% of crows encountered by people wearing the dangerous mask scolded consistently. After three years, 66% of crows scolded the person wearing the dangerous mask. That information was being passed along somehow from crow to crow and maybe even from generation to generation. Marsup says he had thought the memory of the threat would lose its potency, but instead it continued to increase in strength. Now, five years later, even more than 60% of crows respond accurately to the dangerous mask. And they're precise. The initial dangerous mask was a caveman's face with a mask of former US Vice President Dick Cheney as the neutral or control face. 
However, the team made six additional masks, combinations of male, female, Caucasian, Asian, which were used at various sites as a dangerous face or a neutral face. These looked a lot more realistic and similar to each other, yet the crows continued to be very, very good, that's in quotation marks here, at identifying which person was dangerous. So we've been building relationships with the crows in our neighborhood and apparently somehow with their extended community as well. And then I read this scripture in March and I realized that without even knowing it, I had suddenly identified a creative gap in the text that I'd never even thought to interpret. I want to read this text for you. It's from 1 Kings, starting in chapter 16, verse 29. In the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. Ahab, son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, he took as his wife Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbel of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. I do want to point out here that language, the word took, is a word that we often read right over, but the Hebrew word Shigal suggests that Jezebel was in fact stolen. She was taken as a wife. This is not a marriage that she entered into of her own free will. And although it is convenient for the narrative that she is considered the bad person in this story, we can see from other texts that Jezebel was incredibly loyal to her husband. She was trusted by her husband. She was allowed to write letters on behalf and to sign them with his seal. And her sin is that she held faithful to the religion of her family, that she erected worship centers and named prophets to Baal and also to Asherah, um, another side note, Baal and Asherah, although both um, identified as false gods and their monuments as idols, they're not treated exactly the same in scripture. Baal is almost universally condemned, but Asherah is sometimes tolerated. And the difference is that um, in the mythology, Baal is considered or treated as if Baal is the son of God. But Baal's whole focus is on patricide, killing his father and taking his place. So we might actually think of Baal as an early antichrist, that Baal is the opposite of the Christ who would sacrifice everything in order to be obedient to his father. Baal is the opposite of that. He is willing to sacrifice anyone who gets in his way, including and especially his own father. Ahab also made a sacred pull. Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than had all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hile of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Joshua, son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba and Gilead said to Ahab, this is speaking truth to power, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him saying, go from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the wadi. If you were following along, you probably noted that I left out a verse, and that's the verse that says God commanded the ravens to bring him food, and that's an important verse. That is a verse that suggests to us that the ravens even, the crows even, respect God. But the part that I want to focus on here, the ravens brought him bread and meat. For three years, they brought Elijah food. The crows in my neighborhood that I've been build, building a relationship with. In March this year, they brought me, everyone knows I love bread. 
they brought me a large white fluffy dinner roll. They didn't bring me the same kind of food I'd been giving them. And they didn't bring me anything from McDonald's. I don't really care for McDonald's. And I don't know how closely they were observing my ways. I don't know if they were tracking out my route to and from work or paying attention to the groceries that I brought into the house. They were probably paying attention. But they brought me bread. And I suddenly wondered, thinking of the scripture, how long was Elijah in the practice of just casually providing food for crows or for other creatures for that matter? For how many years had he been looking at all of creation as part of his community and supporting whatever need there was, whether human or animal or etc.? I don't think that God could have commanded the ravens to do something that they weren't open to doing. I could be wrong. They're pretty stubborn birds. God does have his ways. But it strikes me that there's this creative gap in the text that allows for me to think about what kind of person Elijah might have been that the text doesn't get to, because that's not important to what the text is doing. Although Elijah is a real living human breathing human being, breathing, my goodness, was doing things. He was living his life, and part of his life, apparently, was being open to accepting bread and meat from birds, but also potentially to providing food for birds. Job 38 says that God listens to the raven's young ones. Psalm 147 says that God gives food to the young ravens when they cry. And I thought to myself that not only is the crow potentially my neighbor, but also this interaction I've been having with the crow or with the crows over these last few years is a model for how I should be living in the world with human beings too. There's a Vietnamese family that lives just over the fence from my partner and me. And when my partner's parents were visiting us and struggling to cut some huge overgrown vines, this Vietnamese neighbor came over our fence and used his power tools to cut them down for us. Later, he invited us to his wedding. Once he was married, he and his wife brought us very large container of, um, not spring rolls, better than that. And I cannot think of what they're called. It's just escaping me right now, but it'll come back to me later. They brought us food. They've shared produce from their garden over the fence with us. And when their chickens got loose in our backyard, I caught them and carried them back. There's another woman who lives over the fence directly behind us. One day she was out gardening and I was also out in my backyard at the same time. And I mentioned to her that I'd never seen her out there before. She'd been sick, she said, for two or three years and unable to take care of her backyard. And we got to talking and she mentioned that there's a plant that had been planted in my backyard, thimbleberry, which I think are beautiful and tasty, but they'd grown through the fence and she was really struggling to keep up with them. And so we ripped out all of our thimbleberry and replaced them with plants that weren't gonna grow over the fence or under the fence and take over her yard. Later, when we were cutting down a, a hawthorn, it fell over the fence and crashed into her flowers on her patio. And so we had to go over and apologize. And she invited us into her home, told us that no, we weren't allowed to take off our shoes, tried to give us coffee. We have another neighbor two women sisters who grew up in the Midwest. They're both retired. They have a cat that visits us frequently. When a heavy windstorm came through um, one, one winter day, a portion of their fence blew into our yard and we just went and fixed it. Didn't ask them for permission, just trusted that they would want us to do that. This year, um, I don't know how much snow you all ended up getting in March, but we had 22 inches that had drifted into our driveway because of the way that the wind works. And they had even more in their driveway. 
They emailed me, Eric, do you have a snow shovel? I'm tired of using my dustpan. We went over and shoveled their driveway. And I could go on, but what we were doing with the crows, I suddenly realized we could be doing for our neighbors. I don't know why I never thought of that. These human beings who live right next door to me were less interesting to me than the animals flying over my head. The crows taught me a lesson that if I want to make a difference, and if I'm also overwhelmed by the problems in the world, I can do whatever's in front of me. I can pay attention to the needs of my neighbors, be they crow or human, and I can respond with kindness, even if I don't necessarily feel like it. And that this is the way that we begin not just to pray, but also to live. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Maryam Kaba, and we do this till we free us, talks about what it feels like to be overwhelmed when we want to transform society. She says, we must remember that we ourselves will also need to transform. Our imagination of what a different world can be is limited. We are deeply entangled in the very systems we are organizing to change. White supremacy, misogyny, ableism, classism, homophobia, transphobia exist everywhere. And we've so thoroughly internalized these logics of oppression that if oppression were to end tomorrow, we might accidentally end up reproducing the very same systems that we were fighting against. She quotes Ruth Wilson Gilmore in noting that building a different world requires that we not only change how we address harm, but also that we change everything, which probably sounds daunting, but it also means that there are so many places where we can start. There are infinite number of places where we can collaborate. There are endless imaginative interventions and experiments for us to create. She says that we are tempted to ask this question. What do we have now and how can we make it better? And she says, instead, let's ask, what can we imagine for ourselves and the world? And I'll tell you that I'm imagining a place where the crows and the squirrels and the humans and the cats are all safe and have everything that they need, not just to survive, but to thrive in the good world God made for us. I went longer than I had planned. That's, that's okay. Is it okay to take, uh, yes, would you definitely. be okay to take some Q&A? Do we have any questions? Uh, any feedback here for, for Eric? Anything? Yeah, Dwight. What about coyotes? <laughs> That's a good that question. Are, that are eating your cats and your squirrels. I don't know. We actually have a, some difficulty with two raccoons that come through our yard every day. And um, we don't know if we'll ever be able to be friends with them. But we're, we're aware that they're there. I apologize for not being in here when Eric was talking about Hillsboro, but I want to give great kudos to Eric and what he's doing there. I've thought often of uh, where they are right now as being the first friends of Hillsboro hmm. about, what, 50 years ago, 55 years ago. And uh, Eric's a major part of that, and he has a board that he's working with, but the major thing that I've seen I get on their, I'm on their mailing list, uh, is the restoring of the building to usable fashion. And most of you remember Bernie, Bernie Bozen, who was there for her entire life, I think. She died just a few years ago. She carried the load herself with very little help for years and years and years. And when she passed, there were many of us thinking, there goes Hillsboro. 
but she had set things up before she left us to prepare that church, that building, to be in use in the community. And Eric, I, I want to say in front of this group and to you personally, I appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, I've, I've watched <laughs> taking care of taxes for the last 12 years. Uh, I think reinstating the... Uh, uh, We're still working on the nonprofit the, status. The corporation, the corporate yeah. status. Um, I think your 501c3, all of these things were sadly uh, left in the lurch when Bernie was left in doing it all herself. I ran into Bernie many years ago when they were uh, working with a, a school that they had there and they were in trouble with the city. And I got to go to a lot of meetings with Bernie and got really well acquainted with her. However, Eric's and my contacts went farther back than that. We were both responsible for driving school buses to Twin Rocks and other gatherings. So we didn't literally run into each other, but we figuratively ran into each other for many, many years. Do you remember when that started? Uh, I, I do. It was my, I got my CDL in December 1996, and I drove a bus to Midwinter that year. Wow. I do remember one trip to, uh, I think it was Twin Rocks summer camp, whereas we were heading into Tillamook, there was a whole bunch of people standing on the side of the road and they looked like young people and they were young people and I learned the story later that Eric had dropped them off. Were you with them? I was with them. You picked yeah. us all up. And we picked them up and took them on and they, they didn't pay us anything but they thanked us. Thanks, Eric. And we break in. Thank you, Eric, for what you shared. Truly beautiful. And as you've been speaking, I've been thinking about how I've known you my whole life as <laughs> a person who I've looked up to my entire life. And so much of the foundation beyond, I mean, I could go on what I love about Eric Muir, but so much of the foundation and the core of what I have learned from you as a person growing up in the programs that you've poured your heart into, is seeing the way that this very ethic has been lived by you your entire life. And I could well up with tears thinking of the hundreds of times I've seen you in a moment where we're all kids and kids are getting a little mean to each other and Eric is the one who's going over to the child who is suffering, right? and is partnering with them and being there with them and showing them love. And that love rubbed up on us and pulled them back into the fold time and again. And I wonder, I would like to continue learning from you, and I wonder if you could share a little bit of what are the queries that you rely on? What are the, like, you know, the questions that you ask yourself to draw yourself continually into that ethic? I don't know if I have a specific query, but there is a question that I dwell on fairly regularly. Um, I'm convinced that unless Quakers become a group that requires marginalized people in order to function, unless we become a group that requires marginalized people to be part of us so that we can function, we might not ever become a group where marginalized people are truly not marginalized, truly not welcome. And I'll give a, a quick example of how I think about this. At Hillsboro Friends, uh, I was hiring a part-time director of our feeding program, and I needed to hire someone very quickly. And I reached out to um, every Quaker-run nonprofit that I could think of uh, in order to find someone who would be a fit, uh, who would be available, and um, who would be acceptable to our board. And we found someone, it took us a week and a half. It was very, very quick turnaround. I felt so successful. And my partner pointed out to me that in doing what I'd done, I had functionally excluded people of color from being considered. And 
So that's why I say this is a challenge. I'm not good at it yet. Like, oh my goodness, I didn't even think about because I don't need people like who aren't like me. And until I actually need people who aren't like me, I'm not going to be capable of thinking of them, of prioritizing them, of centering them, of listening to them, of respecting to them, etc. John Wilkin. Uh, this is Kara. Kara. Began in my parents' sixth grade. Than the hundreds, but with a lot. Jerry, uh, Jerry, I don't know what you call it in school in seminary. Kara, and the the internet connection is there is just so. Uh, on and off so we just get a few words that you're saying uh, at a time I just wanted that he'll begin distance in my this was, I was, I'm 100 and now I was. Kara, would it be possible, John, if I call you right now on my phone? I'm going to give you a call. Okay. There you go. Got it. Go ahead and talk. Okay. I just wanted to do a quick note that Hillsboro Friends Church began as a seminary for Jerry Gillen. And we had worship in our in our living room in Hillsboro. I was in Kara's family were of the very original group at Hillsboro Friends. Is that what you were saying, Kara? You went to Hillsboro, okay. Yeah. And I'm a proud kindergarten graduate of Hillsboro Friends Sunday School class. I think you and I had the same Sunday School teacher, John Hayes. Well, Eric, this really is not just you presenting, it's a, a homecoming, it sounds like. I didn't realize all of the connections and I didn't realize you were crawling under the, uh, the pews and playing sardines. Uh, so next week, friends, we are <laughs> going to play sardines as the message. <laughs> Looking for new ways to do, to do, uh, to do uh, worship meeting. No, I'm kidding. Thank you so much, Thank you. Eric, for blessing us, uh, for you know, just this, uh, uh, this way of storytelling, and we just continue to be blessed by you. Thank you so much, friend. Thank you. All right, take care. All right, friends, well, um, well just gonna wish uh, everyone else uh, the rest of a uh, happy Mother's Day and, and blessings as we go we go on our way. So take care.